19, Facts and Fiction. There's quite a lot of information out there and also misinformation. And so we have a lot of work ahead of us, a lot of things to do and talk about, and hopefully we'll be able to take some questions at the end as well. I want to say at the get-go that the observations that I make here are my own. They don't represent any particular institution. But we'll be sticking to facts and not fiction, and we'll be looking at the data. First, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us now as we study the events of the last year. Please help us to make a determination between fact and fiction and how you would have us behave so that we can more fully fulfill the mission to spread the three angels' message. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So let's jump right in. So as I mentioned, I do a lot of critical care work, and part and parcel of that is getting informed consent for procedures that we do. Now, informed consent is two things. Number one, obviously the patient is consenting or the, the family member, but there has to be an exchange of information there has to be good information so that a decision can be made based on that. And it seems as though in terms of COVID-19, there's been a lot of emphasis placed on consent and not a lot of emphasis placed on being informed. And that's what the purpose of today is, is to make you all informed so that you could make either consent or not consent. So the first myth that we need to tackle is this question, is this just another flu season, COVID-19? Is it just another flu? So what you see here on the x-axis is basically different dates along the year. And what we have here at the bottom is the average of all of the years from 2015 to 2019. And what you have up here is the deaths in 2020. And you, as you can see, significantly increased in the number of deaths throughout the season. So clearly, year 2020 was a standout year in terms of the number of deaths that there were, and there are some possibilities as to what that is from, and it's the most likely, of course, is COVID-19. Now, this is just a graph for the United States, but you could look at this type of graph in any other country and see a very similar graph. You can go to this website, Our World in Data, and actually switch the countries and see other countries to see how the excess mortality fared there. So clearly, COVID-19 is more than just the flu. Another statement that I hear quite often is this statement about, well, 99% of the people survive it. Only 1% of the people die. So a 99% survival rate, is that true? Well, let's take a look here on the left-hand side where we look at the flu versus COVID-19 death rate by age. And you can see that clearly uh, the flu death rate in these lower age groups is 0.02% death rate. And here in those same age groups with COVID-19, we are seeing almost a tenfold increase in the death rate to 0.2%. And of course, it is very large in the older groups greater than 60 years of age. But if you look at all of these together, it's true. The, the death rate on average for COVID-19 is about 1%. So should we worry about the 1%? Again, let's take the example of the United States, but this would work in just about any country. The US population currently is 331 million people. If 1% of the population died because we didn't do any sort of containment measures, then that would mean about 3.3 million people would die instead of the 570,000 that we currently have. Well, of course, more than 3.3 million people are going to be sick. And so if you look at the number of acute care beds in the United States, there's only about 915,000 acute care beds and only 107,000 ICU beds. Clearly not enough even for those who die, let alone those who would become sick enough to be hospitalized. This, of course, would overwhelm the healthcare system and cause other secondary effects. So, for instance, people who had appendicitis or got into car accidents, they wouldn't have any beds to go to. I've seen this personally, where we've had patients at hospitals that needed care at higher levels, uh, at tertiary care hospitals, and we couldn't transfer them to those hospitals. So the 1% that we think isn't going to bother us actually turns out sinking our healthcare system. 
fairly quickly so that it can't help those that don't have COVID-19 or would have survived in this case. And as you can see pictures here from India, that's exactly what is happening. The healthcare system there is being just overwhelmed and healthcare workers are unable to keep up. They themselves coming down with COVID-19. Here we see in India, the number of daily cases skyrocketing. And as a result, we also see deaths in India skyrocketing as well, hitting as high as 4,000 deaths every day. In fact, there are so many bodies that they don't have the capacity to take care of them. Here we see a mass cremation ceremony happening in India. This was, picture was just taken about a week or so ago. And this happened where I was working here in Southern California, where we actually had to get a letter to the state together to tell them exactly what our plan was for when we ran out of ventilators and we almost reached that situation. Um, there was a situation where there, the morgue was filled and we had no place to put the bodies. We had to use a patient's room to put the bodies in there. There, there was such a overwhelming uh, amount of bodies that uh, death certificates, which usually would take a few days to process, it was taking me up to two weeks to get them back from the state office. So even though this is only 1%, 1% in the numerator and hundreds of millions in the denominator equals a pretty grim situation. And then if we decide to look at the 99, there are those who have persistent symptoms after acute COVID-19. You can see here on the right-hand side, a number of issues that are in post COVID-19 follow-up, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, joint pain, chest pain, all the way down to other symptoms that can be prolonged and linger as well. Here's a scattergram that was published on Bloomberg.com for a long haulers chronic illness. And you can see all of these circles here are basically related to symptoms that have persisted after the patient has recovered from COVID-19 with the size of the circles proportional to the, uh, the relative frequency of that particular symptom. So we have, we have fatigue, we have muscle and body aches, we have um, uh, difficulty with um, breathing here. Uh, and the list goes on and on. I am seeing patients in my pulmonary clinic who have come back after hospitalization and they have shortness of breath. And in a number of them, we are finding blood clots in these patients, both in their legs and also in their lungs. Here we have an example, a sad example of a CEO of a, uh, a food restaurant chain that killed himself because of severe ringing in his ears that never went away after he got COVID. Uh, the, the quote here from the family is that Kent battled and fought hard like a former track champion that he was, but the suffering that greatly intensified in recent days became unbearable. So in reality, COVID-19 does have a 99% survival rate, yes, but many of the 99% will live but be sick for weeks to months. And the tax on our healthcare system will be significant for everyone, even those that don't come down with COVID-19. Let's tackle another myth. Uh, this myth, if you get COVID-19, there's nothing you can do before needing hospitalization. You just have to sit at home and wait it out and see if you get worse. Well, during that time, it's up to your immune system to take care of this issue. And there's two parts to your immune system. There is the innate immune system here and also the adaptive immune system. And the one that kicks in first is the innate immune system. It's unfortunately the immune system or portion of the immune system that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 cripples and tries to disable. And that allows it to multiply and spread throughout the body. One of the primary products of the innate immune system is something called IFN or interferon. Interferon, just like the name suggests, interferes with viral infections. So it's very important to fighting viral infections. And unfortunately, SARS-CoV-2 suppresses the body's ability to make interferon. And we can see this in several scientific peer-reviewed published studies that have been uh, noted here, we can see that on the y-axis is the amount of interferon alpha-2, and we can see that in patients with high levels of secretion of interferon, the course was mild, and in low 
amounts of secretion, the course was very critical. We see that over here as well in this situation. And we know that this is significant because we know that induction of hyperthermia at 39 degrees centigrade, which happens to be when a patient gets a fever, can actually increase significantly the amount of interferon secreted from macrophages and cells of the innate immune system. Here we see a situation where these monocytes were taken out of patients at various different temperatures and activated. And what clearly is shown here is that when the body temperature hits about 39 degrees Celsius, which is the temperature of a fever, there is a tenfold increase in the amount of interferon gamma that is secreted in these patients, which would be um, very good if you're trying to increase and enhance the innate immune system. And of course, there are various ways of increasing core body temperature, not the least of which is hydrotherapy. In fact, there was an Austrian psychiatrist who did something very similar on his neurosyphilis patients in his psych ward by giving them an injection of malaria. Now, the malaria caused the fevers to be very, very high. And with those high fevers, the temperature was able to activate the innate immune system and to kill off the neurosyphilis. And for this work, Dr. Julius Wagner Joreg received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1927. As you can see here in this paper that was published in 2013, there was other ways of doing this, including immersion of the individual in a hot bath or placing him in a heat cabinet. Well, of course, this was being done. And in fact, it was being done even well before that in 1918, as is written here by Dr. Wells Rubel, who was the medical director of the Adventist Sanitarium in Boston, Massachusetts, and later to become the president of the College of Medical Evangelists in Loma Linda, California. He wrote here in Life and Health, May 1st, 1919, the present epidemic of influenza has furnished excellent opportunity to test out the efficacy of rational treatment in dealing with respiratory disorders, especially in conditions accompanying and following attacks of influenza. So what exactly was he referring to when he talked about sanitarium rational treatment? Well, this is things that are done during the early phase. It's that phase when someone comes down with symptoms and is still at home and not needing to go to the hospital because his oxygen levels are okay and he doesn't need supplemental oxygen. So what are these types of things that were practiced in the sanitariums in the Northeast at that time in the country? It was fresh air, it was sleep, it was sunlight, it was hydrotherapy, peace and rest, and all of these things came together for sanitarium rational treatment. And here you see a postcard of all these things coming together of the Loma Linda Sanitarium in Loma Linda, California. Certainly plenty of trees, plenty of sunshine, out of the cities, fresh air, things of that nature. Now, this was in stark contrast to what was going on in the army hospitals at the time when the soldiers were coming home with the flu epidemic. And Dr. Wells Rubel wanted to make a comparison about what was going on in the sanitariums versus what was going on in these army hospitals. So he gathered the data and he compared. And what he found was something very startling. Whereas in the army hospitals, it was very important that they were to prevent the patients from getting pneumonia in both cases. Here in the army hospitals, of those that came down with cases, 16% of them went on to develop pneumonia. Now, remember, this is before antibiotics and uh, getting pneumonia was a 50-50 chance of dying. And you can see here in the army hospitals, about 40% of them went on to die, giving you a case fatality rate of about 6.4%. Whereas in the sanitariums, because they got onto things rather early and they boosted the immune system with hydrotherapy and increasing interferon and such, only 2% in his counts went to develop pneumonia. And of course, again, pneumonia being a death sentence, about half went on to develop um, death in these cases, giving an infection fatality ratio of 1.1%, a fraction of that in the army hospitals. So in truth, there are many things that we can learn and do now 
to prepare for a possible SARS-CoV-2 infection and for pandemics that may come in the future. We must. And if you want more information on that, go to amensda.org for more videos and information about hydrotherapy, rest, exercise, and things of that nature. Another myth that obviously gets perpetuated here is masks and physical distancing do not work. Well, I can tell you that they don't work 100%, but they do work. Masks prevent a lot of the large droplets, which is important. You can see here in a study where they looked at the, the uh, mask versus not wearing a mask. Here we have speech on the upper portion, and here we have a cough. And here we have the situation with, with no mask. And you can see here with speech and no mask, there are droplets. And with cough and no mask, there's so many droplets, it just basically whited out. And when we look at uh, with a surgical mask, we hardly see any droplets in either coughing or speaking. And, um, and that is uh, also seen here with a um, basically a regular mask um, that uh, this patient is wearing. Again, if you look at a regular surgical mask, the particle size that it can capture is about 200 to 500 nanometers. So anything less than that is gonna be able to get through pretty easily. And in fact, the size of a SARS-CoV-2 virion is 100 nanometers, and it's smaller than that. And that's why masks don't prevent aerosolization or very, very small particulate aerosolization. And of course, they don't stop oxygen either because the oxygen molecule is 0.363 nanometers. But what surgical masks do stop are these large respiratory droplets that the SARS-CoV-2 likes to hang out in. And in terms of that, masks are very good at preventing large droplet transmission, which usually happens in close proximity. And that's why they say if you can't maintain distancing, masks are your next best thing. What about this thing about oxygen saturation? Well, they did a study looking at that. They had three measurements of oxygen before wearing a mask, and it was around 96.1% saturation. And then three measurements for about an hour while they were wearing a mask, and it went to 96.5%. And then they took it off again and took three more measurements over the next hour and averaged them. And it was again, 96.3. So as you would imagine, because the oxygen molecule is so small, a mask is not gonna prevent oxygen from getting into your lungs. One of the things that is really illustrative of how masks help and how ventilation is important is with air travel. Now, there's about one to two million people who travel daily in the United States and, um, and even more around the world in terms of people in planes. Now, we would have imagined that a lot more people would have gotten coronavirus by doing this. But the reason why they don't is because they wear masks on the plane. So that prevents transmission in close proximity. But as we mentioned, it doesn't prevent aerosolization. The reason why we don't see that as a problem is because in an airplane, there's about 20 to 30 air changes per hour. That's incredible amount of air changes. And of course they use very powerful HEPA filters and the air that comes in from the jets above you, 50% of that is coming from the outside. So they're only recycling about 50%. And so, um, as, uh, as was mentioned here by Sebastian Hall of the Institute for Medical Virology, he says that an airplane cabin is probably one of the most secure conditions that you can be in. And again, because we're taking care of droplets and also aerosolization. But we really shouldn't be surprised by isolation and things of that nature. Here is an article out of the Northern Union Reaper. December 17, 1918, they were doing this even back then. And this was the Hutchinson Seventh-day Adventist Seminary, where about 120 of its 180 students came down with the Spanish flu, which is deadly. And look what they did at the time. They were at once put to bed with a trained nurse taking temperature and watching for symptoms of the epidemic. And those, if those symptoms developed, the patient was required to remain in bed. So even then they were doing isolation. Again, to guard against this, every patient was required to remain a bed from two to five days after apparent full recovery, according to their state of their flu affliction. As a result of the system of handling a disease that is scoring thousands of victims every day, there has not been one case that could have been called serious or a single death 
in the seminary, although there were more than 90 persons affected. The record is remarkable. It makes the ordinary methods of dealing with flu appear irrational. So when you have a virus that is contagious, it's beneficial, it's advantageous to isolate. So again, masks and distancing do work. The recommendation on when to do it is based on the prevalence of the virus and the environment of the individuals. Okay, so let's talk about vaccines. First of all, though, I want to give you a little idea about where I'm coming from. I work at two hospitals in Southern California, and we were inundated with patients. But before that, I was asked back in the summer of 2020 if I was going to take the vaccine that was coming out. And I said, I don't know. I haven't seen efficacy data. I haven't seen safety data. Now, there were other people that already made up their mind that they were definitely going to take it. And I thought that was unwise because we hadn't seen the data. And there was also people that had made up their mind that they weren't going to take it. And uh, they had their reasons as well. Well, in my experience, I saw devastation. I, we had to create a completely new intensive care unit just for COVID patients. It was like uh, I was doing a spacewalk when I would go in there. I'd have to dress up. When I came home, I would have to disrobe in the garage before coming in. We have to wash our clothes in, in plastic bags. I've seen whole families get wiped out. I mean, we were admitting people to our intensive care unit and we were trying to find family members on the phone only to realize that they were also down in the emergency room getting admitted. Um, my whole family was at risk. I was afraid of bringing home the virus. I've actually been at the bedside and watched colleagues that I have trained with die of COVID-19. I was holding their hand as they died. Um, even to this day, talking to nurses who, instead of just seeing two patients, which is what they would normally would be doing, they were seeing four patients and uh, they were dying so quickly, these patients and more would be coming in to this day when you ask them to talk about it, their tears come into their eyes. And so the things that we saw was things that I will never be able to unsee. My biggest fear at the time was spreading the infection without knowing that I was spreading this infection. You know, natural remedies, which I'm a big believer in, um, work to prevent disease in a patient once they know they have the disease. The problem with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is that you can spread this virus asymptomatically in the days before you become symptomatic. And so once you know that you're sick, it's been too late to prevent that. You certainly can prevent you from getting sick and going to the hospital, but in terms of you preventing spread to somebody else, it is too late. You've already spread the virus. So there's a lot of information out there. Let's go through it and tackle some of the misconceptions. And of course, there's a lot of vaccines out there. We're not going to talk about all of them. I'm going to concentrate mostly on the mRNA vaccines because those are the ones that are being used mostly in the and around the world and they came out first. So we'll talk about those. We have the most data for those. And I'll be talking about things in the United States because that's what I'm familiar with. But a lot of these things you can apply to every country in the world. So one of the things that gets talked about is that the vaccine development was rushed and that corners were cut. And we see here on the top line, a typical vaccine timeline rollout. You can see here, if we knew about this virus in 2020, it would have been 14 years before we'd have distribution. This is the typical way things go. It takes a long time to do these sorts of things. And what happened here is that they were compressed. But in fact, no specific entity was cut out. All of these things had to happen. But in, as you can see in these cases, the phase one, two, and three trials occurred. But as they were doing, they were building the factories and getting ready for manufacturing in case and with the assumption that they would pass and they would do well. And this was all facilitated through planning and understanding and also removing barriers uh, so that they could do these sorts of things. So uh, was the vaccine development rushed? I guess you could say it was, it was accelerated, but in terms of corners being cut and things being left out. So was there a phase two trial that was left out? No. Were there animal studies that were left out? No, all of these things were done. They were just done more in parallel rather than in series. And if you look back in history, this has been done before. I mean, if you remember in World War II in the United States, when they went to war, they had to basically take the car factories in Detroit and turn them into uh, war-making machines. 
And the way they did this was by focusing like a laser on increasing output and production. At the time, William Knudsen, who was the president of General Motors, very, very well-paid CEO, took a $1 job with the government to coordinate this, um, this mandate. He said, the first half of 1941 is crucial. Gentlemen, we must outbuild Hitler. And that is exactly what they did. Here you can see airplanes coming off of former assembly lines for automobiles at the rate of one airplane per hour. Now, currently, we are fighting a different war. We're not fighting an army. We're fighting a virus. And so the battlefield is going to look a little different. The factories are going to look a little different. This is where they make the Pfizer coronavirus vaccine mRNA. And you can see here it's different. It's a little bit different than... Uh, back in the 1940s, but it's the same situation. You're basically ramping up the ability to produce millions of products so that you can get these out and amplify it. And you have the entire infrastructure working on this one plan. But what about the idea that this is new technology? Well, there's a story of mRNA, how a once dismissed idea became a leading technology in the COVID vaccine race. And this was an article that appeared in the Boston Globe. What you may not know is the story of putting messenger RNA into cells actually has been around for over 30 years. Since the 1990s, we've been looking at putting mRNAs into mice. In 2005, they modified the nucleotides to get around early destruction. See, the key there is that a lot of people believe that the mRNA is going to hang around forever and change your genome. The, the, the problem actually is, is that the mRNA doesn't hang around long enough, and they've had to figure out ways of modifying it so that the cells don't destroy it right away and last actually for long enough to actually get useful proteins made out of it. In 2013, they started working on a medication based on mRNA. Uh, and in 2020, of course, when the coronavirus came out, they immediately switched all of their attention to coming out with a vaccine for the COVID-19. Here is the actual paper published in the prestigious journal Science. Look at the date, 1990, titled Direct Gene Transfer into Mouse Muscle in Vivo. So this technology has actually been around for 30 years. It's not something they invented in 2020. And so, in fact, vaccine development was accelerated and inefficiencies eliminated, but no steps were eliminated. So before we talk about the vaccine itself, what we really ought to look at is the pathophysiology of the infection itself and then the vaccine. So let's talk about what happens when SARS-CoV-2, the virus itself, infects human cells. So here we have the actual virus. And what it does is it connects with a receptor on the cell surface. After that happens, the cell absorbs the virus. The messenger RNA goes inside into the cytosol of the cell. And that then produces more viruses. And those viruses go on to infect more and more and other cell tissue. And so here we can see on autopsies, the amount of viral particles all over the body. We see it in the lung, the major airways, the heart, the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, adipose tissue, pancreas, kidney, and the bone marrow. And we see it all throughout the body. So the virus actually goes in and many, many, many tissues all over the body. Well, what happens then is your innate immune system, as we mentioned at the beginning, has macrophages. These macrophages recognize these viruses as foreign and eats them up, digests them, and presents the internal proteins of these viruses on the, cell, on the surface of its cell and presents it to the adaptive immune system, the B cells and the T cells. And because there are 25 different proteins that make up SARS-CoV-2, there's gonna be a lot of proteins that are gonna be presented to the B and T cells, and a lot of those B and T cells are gonna be activated. And so because of the 25 different proteins, you're gonna have a lot of different antibodies that are gonna be elevated and increased in secretion to combat those 25 different proteins. And so you get immunity, but you also get autoimmunity. And some of the things that have been suggested would be type one diabetes, 
lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, celiac disease, herpetic stromal keratitis, multiple sclerosis, ITP. So all of these things are diseases that come about from autoantibodies. And so the question is, is because there's 25 different proteins, the chances of you getting a antibody response to one of those proteins cross-reacting with your body and causing one of these diseases is fairly high. And that's what we see after viral infections typically. And we can see post COVID-19 complications. You can see here without getting into too much detail, uh, common symptoms, organ damage in the heart, the lungs, the brain, blood clots, as we've talked about, mood and fatigue issues, and questionable long-term side effects, long haulers syndrome, as we talked about. You can see here the short and potential long-term adverse health incomes of COVID-19, like Guillain-Barre, pediatric inflammatory syndrome, um, they say here that the burden of caring for COVID-19 survivors is likely to be huge. And that's based on what we're seeing. And of course, the denominator, the number of people that are actually coming down with this. So let's talk about how the messenger RNA vaccine works. Again, here are the little lipid droplets. There's no cellular tissue in them. There's no preservatives, no formaldehyde, no mercury, no adjuvants in the mRNA vaccines. There is um, this PEG which is how it's put together. Some people have allergic reactions to, and we'll talk about that. But what we do when that gets injected is it goes into the muscle cells where it is injected. And uh, of course it releases its messenger RNA into the cell, which then makes just one protein, a spike protein. And there's none of the other 25 different proteins that are seen when you get a coronavirus infection. So this spike protein, of course, is just in those cells around where the muscle is. It doesn't go to all the different parts of your body like coronavirus does. And so of course the macrophage is doing its thing and it eats up those spike proteins and it presents it on its cell surface and it presents it to the B cells and the T cells. But because there's only one protein, um, you're only gonna get a specific, very narrow spectrum of antibodies against that spike protein, which gives you immunity. And the question is, does it give autoimmunity? And so, so far, no consistent pattern of autoimmunity has yet been discovered in the mRNA vaccination uh, uh, logs. And usually when we do see this, it usually pops up within two or three months of vaccination. And these vaccines have been given into arms since late July of 2020. And so we're now about nine to 10 months out and still have not seen issues with either the Pfizer or the Moderna BioNTech, uh, Pfizer BioNTech or Moderna vaccinations. So the question is, are the vaccines safe or effective? And that myth out there is that the vaccines are neither safe or effective is interesting. The way we find out if something is safe and effective is by doing randomized placebo controlled trials. And this is not too dissimilar to what happened in Daniel chapter one, verse 12, when Daniel and his three friends decided to do not a randomized trial or even a placebo trial, but definitely a controlled trial to see whether or not if they ate pulse for, for a specific period of time, they could improve their health as opposed to eating meat and drinking wine from the king's table. And so this is probably one of the earliest controlled trials ever recorded in literature. And it is the way that we know, and it's the way that convinced Nebuchadnezzar anyhow, that uh, this is how we decide if something is safe and effective. So that's what we're going to use to evaluate these vaccines. And so let's go through this briefly. I have these uh, Pfizer BioNTech here in the first column, Moderna in the second column, the Oxford AstraZeneca, which has not been given emergency use authorization in the United States, but is used worldwide. And of course, the Johnson and Johnson, which has been given emergency use authorization in the United States and is beginning to be used worldwide. And of course, the mRNA vaccine vaccines are here on the left-hand side. They were first given emergency use authorization. They have been shown to be 95% effective, 94% uh, effective. How did they figure this out? They vaccinated a, a number of people. In this case, uh, 43,000 people either got vaccine or placebo, and they waited for them to come down with symptoms of COVID-19. When enough of them came down with symptoms, they looked to see how many of them were vaccinated and how many of them were, were placebo. And 162 of the cases were in the placebo arm and only eight in the vaccine arm, which calculated out about a 94% efficacy. Similar numbers with the 
uh, Moderna as well. So, and we also have data now based on infection that shows that not only do these vaccines prevent disease in the recipient, but it also prevents the recipient from getting infection and passing on infections, therefore. And you can see here in the vaccinated group, in terms of infection, only 0.04 per 1,000 person days, whereas in the placebo group, 1.38 per 1,000 person days. That's about a 90% effectiveness after the second dose to prevent infection. In terms of side effects, however, um, interestingly, we, we know that when you get a vaccination like this, it's going to cause pain, swelling, redness. This means that your immune system is working. It's doing what it needs to do. The real question is, is are there serious adverse events like anaphylaxis, like uh, death? And when they looked at the vaccinated group, there was 0.6% serious adverse events. So that would be six in 1,000 people. Whereas in the placebo, there was five in 1,000 people. So the question is, is whether or not those serious adverse effects were related to the vaccine or just were going to happen on their own. And we see here in the Moderna data, about three people died in the placebo group, two in the vaccine. Serious adverse events were the vaccinated 0.5%, uh, again, five in 1,000, and the placebo were two in 1,000. So very, very similar. When we look at Oxford AstraZeneca, um, this one had some issues with blood clots. It is being used in, um, in Brazil. There was one death in the study. About 70% efficacy, a little bit lower than the 94% and the 95 here, but again, probably tested on populations that had more variants. Uh, again, also with the Johnson & Johnson, tested on populations that had more variants, therefore might not be as effective at preventing infection, but still very, very good at preventing death and disease. Uh, recently, we discussed about blood clots. Um, also, blood clots uh, increase in terms of uh, monitoring in those taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And when I say that there was an increased risk of blood clots, that was because of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is a blood clot in the, in the, in the veins that drain the brain. And if you look here at the incidence of these in the general population, about 0.5 in 100,000 per year. In COVID-19, up to 20 per 100,000 uh, COVID-19 cases. In pregnancy, 10 to 12 per 100,000 deliveries. Oral contraceptive, up to 40 people per 100,000. What they were looking at in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is 0.09 or 0.1 incidence per 100,000 vaccination. So a very small increase, but nevertheless wanted to be very careful about uh, making sure that they were looking for that. So definitely uh, an issue, but uh, one that uh, did not stop them from reauthorizing them to use that and to vaccinate in the United States. We talked earlier about allergic reactions. If we look at the acute allergic reactions to the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, specifically Pfizer and Moderna, we see here that there is a 0.025% rate of anaphylaxis. Now, how does that compare to like penicillin? Well, when you look at the penicillin allergy, this was recently updated in 2020, very similar numbers, 0.02% to 0.04%. So arguably, uh, potentially the same or less in terms of the rate for penicillin allergy. So we can say the vaccines are relatively safe and very effective. What about the myth that vaccines will affect fertility? Well, we can see here in the groups that were tested, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson, there was 12 pregnancies in the control group, 11 pregnancies in the vaccinated group, and you can see the numbers were similar all the way down. We also see that the miscarriage rates were very similar all the way down in both the control group and the vaccinated group so that there really wasn't a difference at all in terms of those that could get pregnant and those that had mis miscarriages. And I should note here that none of these patients were allowed to be pregnant to be in the studies. These were patients that got pregnant after getting into the study and they were followed. So there really is no evidence that vaccines affect fertility at this time. Okay, now let's talk a little bit more spiritual then. Does taking a vaccine mean that I lack faith? And several people have quoted Psalms 91 to me, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So if I do what is right, then I should be fine without getting COVID-19. Remember that Christ was tempted, and we will be tempted 
just like Christ was as well. Devil did his best when he said, he quoted Psalms 91 on the, uh, on the temple when he said, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. To which Jesus replied, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So is it faith or is it presumption then? There is a very fine line between that there. God has often used human entities in terms of his will on earth. We see this all over the place. With Lazarus, he asked the men to roll the stone away. He asked the men to cut off the bandages off of Lazarus. But for what the men could not do for themselves, he did for them by raising Lazarus from the dead. So many times the uh, God that we know uses human entities to do the work that he would have us do. We know that the medical mission service is the right arm of the gospel. And so uh, he uses human beings. I think it is interesting that prior to Ellen G. White's health vision in 1863, where she saw that vegetables and fruits and things that were normally not available in the Northeast United States were now available because of something called the Bessemer process, which was discovered in 1856, which allowed iron to be turned into steel. And because of this, the railway, the railway was able to be expanded across the country and food products that were not normally available were now being made available. So it was just at this right time. And we, of course, we know that the, the word of God spread throughout the world after the, the printing press was invented at a much faster rate. And so we see technology working hand in hand with the gospel. So the question comes down to, again, is it faith or is it presumption to not use these things that are available to us by technology when we can use them? And again, these are my observations, but Ellen White has been quoted as saying, if we neglected to do that which is within the reach of nearly every family and ask the Lord to relieve pain when we are too indolent to make use of these remedies within our power, it is simply presumption. So it's my observation that taking a vaccine does not mean that I lack faith. What about the statement that vaccines are unnatural and are opposed to the health message and should never be used? Well, you might get that from statements, for instance, that uh, are in spiritual gifts. In 1864, I was shown that more deaths have been caused by drug taking than from all other causes combined. And you can see the other statements there that uh, are attributed to Ellen White, and, and rightfully so, because if you look at what medications were being given at that time, uh, you can look here um, as referenced by Dr. John Hone in Adventist Review, the Science and Practice of Medicine published in 1868, you can see that a lot of the diseases that we have today were there, but the treatments at the time are chemicals banned, restricted from human exposure by the Environmental Protection Agency. Since that time, a number of laws in the country, like in 1906, 1938, 1962, have basically cleaned up a lot of these medications and have taken a lot of the toxicities out of them. Of course, we have anesthesia today, antibiotics, clot busters, things that certainly help human beings in emergencies. But I think a lot can still be said for what Ellen White said back in the 1800s. I still believe that we probably overuse medication today to treat things that if people had a proper diet and let nature take care of them, we wouldn't need those medications. I've seen that personally, where I work here in California, and had visited Weimar Institute where patients would check in to those residential health programs and come out much more healthy and on less of their medications. Of course, it was done under medical supervision. So how best should we understand the role of vaccination given these statements from Ellen White? And I'm, I turned to a letter that was written by her son, W.C. White, from the Ellen White estate to a lady in Tennessee in September of 1935. Her son writes, the testimony strongly condemn the use of quinine and everyone knows that it is bad for the constitution, but there are at the present time only a few persons who have been able to check malarial fever without quinine. One time while we were in Australia, a brother who had been acting as a missionary in the islands told mother of the sickness and death of his firstborn son. He was seriously afflicted with malaria and his father was advised to give him quinine. But in view of the counsel and the testimonies to avoid the use of quinine, he refused to administer it, and his son died. When he met Sister White, 
he asked for her this question. Would I have sinned to give the boy quinine when I knew of no other way to check the malaria and when the prospect was that he would die without it? In reply, she said, no, we are expected to do the best we can. It is our business to learn to do without those things that are harmful to the system. The warning given us regarding the use of poisonous drugs should not lead us to see our friends die when we know that the use of the drug would save life. And friends, I would say here, based on the information that we have with randomized placebo-controlled trials, we know that these vaccines are good at preventing infections and hospitalizations. Sister, he goes on, Sister White has written much about the advisability of women physician attending women, but women physicians are few and men in some cases are supposed to be more skillful. At one time, a lady teacher in Loma Linda refused to teach her class of boys what was in the regular course regarding childbirth. This raised such much discussion and the teacher brought to Sister White the testimony showing what she had written and said, does this mean what it says or not? Sister White replied, I have nothing more to say. I will not answer your question. I do not intend that what I have written regarding what God has shown to me as the best way to do to be taken by men and made a law to govern all medical action. Here's another letter that Willie, Wright, Willie White wrote to Elsie uh, Kellogg in Loma Linda, California in 1924. Dear Brother Kellogg, I hold in my hand your letter of January 20th, asking if I can tell you what the attitude was of Mrs. E.G. White toward vaccination. She regarded it as a perplexing question. I do not remember of her ever saying or writing that she had special instruction regarding vaccination. In my earlier days, she spoke of it as something dangerous and related my own experience. She said that as a child, I was perfectly healthy until I was vaccinated. And by that, my health was much impaired. And I'll just say at this point that the vaccinations of the early years were, were very rudimentary and uh, they did not understand germ theory as well. There was bacteria involved in these vaccines. And uh, once this was noted, obviously things had cleaned up. She, he goes on, mother listened attentively to the argument that the methods of vaccination had been improved. And when in our travels, we were brought to a large city where smallpox was raging and the matter was discussed as to whether or not that I and my associates should be vaccinated, she offered no objection. And in view of the argument of physicians that it was not only for our own safety, but for the safety of others, I and my associates were vaccinated. And of course, D.E. Robinson wrote as well, recorded in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 303. You'll be interested to know, however, that at a time when there was an epidemic of smallpox in the vicinity, she herself was vaccinated and urged her helpers, those connected with her, to be vaccinated. In taking this step, Sister White recognized the fact that it has been proven that vaccination either renders one immune from smallpox or greatly lightens its effects if one comes down with it. She also recognized the danger of their exposing others if they fail to take this precaution. So at this point, it would be good to note that vaccines are not opposed to the health message and should be considered in consultation with a healthcare provider. And I would be remiss in mentioning that the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists has a, an official statement on this, which you can read here and also is found below at Adventist.org. Okay, well, what about vaccines are the mark of the beast? Or if they're not, they're at least leading to the enforcement thereof and should be resisted. When I think about end time events, I think about at the end, when we will be at the time of the end, we'll need to be obedient to God. We'll be asked to pay homage to an image upon threat of death. A door will close, the close of probation, followed by seven plagues that will not touch us, but will affect our enemies. And during this time, we'll be freed from the bonds of sin, and we will be with God, God, Emmanuel, God with us. Well, there's a very similar story in the Bible that parallels that, that I think is very instructive, and that's Daniel's three friends. See, Daniel's three friends were led to the plains of Dura, obedient to the king's call to gather. They were asked to pay homage to an image with threat of death, and a door closed on them, the fiery furnace, which was seven times hotter, but it did not touch them. It only touched their enemies. And 
in that time, the bonds that were around their wrists fell off and they walked literally with God in that fiery furnace in person. So why is that important? Notice here in Prophets and Kings, page 504, Ellen White gives us very good information that the three wise friends of Daniel were wise men and were well aware of what was going on before they got to the plains of Dura. They could see that that statue was being built. It says, with an enthusiasm born of boundless ambition and selfish pride, he, Nebuchadnezzar, entered into counsel with his wise men about how to bring this about. So even though they knew that this was leading to a showdown, they still obeyed the king. Why? Because it did not go against the Ten Commandments. Notice that Nebuchadnezzar was impressed uh, as he was about to throw them into the fiery furnace for disobedience. As the three Hebrews stood before the king, he was convinced that they possessed something the other wise men of his kingdom did not have. They had been faithful in the performance of every duty. Folks, I believe that the, the job, the goal, the order given from heaven of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to proclaim the three angels' message. And anything that causes us to deviate from that will weaken our message in that day. And I believe that is what Satan has in plan for us. And so when these side issues come up, if we can be distracted or if we can be accused of insubordination to the king, that works in the devil's favor so that when the time does come for us to stand up, our testimony will be cheapened. I believe that Ellen White was shown this, and she has given us testimony in this regard. She writes, those who compose our churches have traits of character that will lead them, if they are not very careful, to feel indignant because of an account of misrepresentation, their liberty in regard to working on Sunday is taken away. Do not fly into a passion over this matter, but take everything in prayer to God. He alone can restrain the power of rulers. Walk not rashly. Let none boast unwisely of their liberty, using it for a cloak of maliciousness. But as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. In manuscript releases, she says, this advice is to be of real value to all who are brought into straight places. Nothing that shows defiance or that could be interpreted as maliciousness must be shown. In testimonies to the church, she says, it is our duty in every case to obey the laws of our land unless they conflict with the higher law, which God spoke with an audible voice from Sinai and afterward engraved on stone with his own finger. The 10 precepts of Jehovah are the foundation of all righteous and good laws. Those who love God's commandments will conform to every good law of the land. And then in Acts of the Apostles, she says, we are not required to defy authorities. Our words, whether spoken or written, should be carefully considered. She goes on in evangelism. Our work is not to make a raid on the government, but to prepare a people to stand in the great day of our Lord. The fewer attacks we make on authorities and powers, the more work we will do for God. If we wish to convince unbelievers that we have the truth that sanctifies the soul and transforms the character, we must not vehemently charge them with their errors. Thus, we force them to the conclusion that the truth does not make us kind and courteous, but coarse and rough. Some, easily excited, are always ready to take up the weapons of warfare. In times of trial, they will show that they have not founded their faith on the solid rock. Let Seventh-day Adventists do nothing that will mark them as lawless and disobedient. Let them keep all inconsistency out of their lives. Our work is to proclaim the truth, leaving the issues with the Lord. Do all in your power to reflect the light, but do not speak words that will irritate or provoke. Teach the people to conform in all things to the laws of their state. When they can, do so without conflicting with the law of God. And finally, from letter four, 1898, whatever your opinions you may entertain in regard to casting your vote in political questions, you are not to proclaim it by pen or voice. Our people need to be silent upon questions which have no relation to the third angel's message. If ever a people needed to draw nigh to God, it is Seventh-day Adventists. There have been a wonderful devices and plans made. A burning desire has taken hold of men or women to proclaim something or bind up with something. They do not know what, but the silence of Christ upon many subjects was true eloquence. And folks, I have to wonder whether or not the silence of Ellen White on vaccines was also true eloquence. 
Vaccines are not the mark of the beast. They are a medical intervention with risks and benefits that are provided by authorities. You should make sure you understand the facts and the data to make an informed decision. Thank you. I'm hoping that everyone can hear me. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for attending this presentation. We hope that you are able to join us for a question, question and answer session. It will be held today at 1230 Pacific, 330 Eastern time. The